How your engine works. Some things you need to know. In this video we're going to look at diesel boat engines. We're going to look at how they work, how they need to function, we're going to look at fuel injection and lots of other stuff. Stick around, you never know, you might learn something. We're going to start with the basics. First, know your engine. Now whether you've got a Volvo Penta, a Yamaha, a Nanny, a Beta Marine, or even one of the Lombardi series of engines, there's some stuff, some basics that you really need to know. The first thing you need to know is your engine number. There may be a number of different engines using the same block or the same components, but they can differ. You need to know this number, especially if you're ordering parts. Now individual engines may differ, but let's look at some of the components. I'll use this Volvo engine as an illustration, mainly because the parts are easy to identify, like the alternator, the starter motor, the water pump or coolant pump, the raw water pump or salt water pump, the exhaust outlet, which sometimes has an injection elbow, and then on modern engines, there's a control box, usually containing a few relays and a fuse, a few bits and pieces. Let's move on. You need to identify specific maintenance points, like the header tank for the coolant, the dipstick to check your oil, the oil filler cap, your engine oil filter, your diesel filters, then there's your diesel pump, and finally, your injector pump and your injectors. Now as I said, engines will differ but the same basic components you'll find on all diesel engines. OK, let's look at some of the engine parts or engine components. Let's start at the bottom with the sump, then there's the crank, the connecting rods, pistons, the combustion chamber or cylinder within the engine block, the valves and the valve seats, and the cylinder head which contains the valve gear, and then the rocker box cover or cam cover which keeps the oil in the engine. Now your engine may have a turbo, it may even have two. The exhaust gases come out at high speed from the exhaust manifold and into the turbine. The turbine has a shaft that goes through it and this shaft turns another turbine at the other end. This turbine, or compressor, compresses air and forces it into the engine. Because the air is compressed, there's more of it. And the more air that goes into the engine, the more fuel can be put in to give you a bigger burn, more power. Some engines are exactly the same, apart from the fact one has a turbo and one doesn't. The one with the turbo gives out more power. The main backbone of your engine is the crankshaft, and you can see one here. This is an eight cylinder crankshaft. The crankshaft is connected to the big end of the connection rod. The top end of the connection rod, the small end, is connected to the piston. As the pistons go up and down, this reciprocating motion is turned into rotary motion. The crankshaft will be connected to a camshaft, either an overhead cam or an overhead valve type and it's this cam that drives the rockers which push the valves down and allow the exhaust gases out and the fresh air in. On an overhead cam engine, the cam is over the top of the engine, but it's still driven from the crankshaft and still pushes the valves down and opens and closes them at the right moment. So that's how it works. So whether you have an overhead valve or overhead cam engine, it's the cam that drives the valves. Now the bit all you schoolboys have been waiting for. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. OK, stop your giggling at the back. Depending on what type of engine you have, some will have a preheater which is in the top of the cylinder head and heats the air as the piston comes up. Some will modify the injection in order 
to get the engine started and warmed up. Either way, the principle is the same. OK, on the intake stroke or suck stroke or induction stroke, the inlet valve opens and air is drawn into the cylinder by the piston dropping down the bore. On the compression or squeeze stroke, both the valves are closed and as the piston comes up, the air inside the cylinder is compressed. In a diesel engine, this rate of compression is extremely high. As the air is compressed, it heats up to about 550 degrees Celsius. At just about the moment of maximum compression, or top dead center, roughly, diesel fuel is injected as a spray. This pressure can be as much as 40 bar or 600 psi. This spray mixes with the hot swirling air and spontaneously explodes. Bang! We call this the power stroke. The rapidly expanding gases force the piston down inside the cylinder. As the crankshaft rotates, the piston then goes back up and ejects the hot gases and exhaust out through the open exhaust valve. Hence, suck, squeeze, bang, blow, or induction, compression, power, exhaust. A four-stroke engine. There are some engines which are diesel and two-stroke. These are mainly commercial engines made by people like Detroit Diesel. Obviously, being a two-stroke, you get twice the power of a similarly sized four-stroke engine. But perhaps we'll look at them another time. Diesel engines have some specific needs in order for them to work efficiently. We've looked at diesel fuel systems before, in previous videos. But suffice to say, Diesels need to have very clean fuel. The injector pumps are complicated and can be subject to damage if they have dirty fuel. Here's how it works. A diesel pump has a shaft which drives cams. These cams push pistons up and down. And as the pistons go up and down, the liquid that cannot be compressed is then ejected out through the particular port for whichever cylinder. It's the timing of this pump to the crankshaft and the position of the piston which is critical to having the engine firing at the right point. Meanwhile, at the injector, the fuel enters the injector and goes down through a gallery where it meets a nozzle valve. When the predetermined pressure is reached, this valve lifts and injects diesel into the cylinder or combustion chamber. Diesel injectors and pumps work at extremely high pressures, so be careful. And to be honest, if you don't know how the pump works, you shouldn't really be playing with it. Some of the fuel left over from the injection is allowed to travel back up the injector and out from the leak-off pipe. This then returns back to your tank. This surplus fuel helps to cool the injector and also lubricate it, preventing wear. As technology advances, we're now seeing more common rail diesels used as marine diesel engines. The type of pump on these diesels has just one single outlet going to a common rail. The injectors on this type of engine are energised by a solenoid being told to fire by the engine's ECU, so it's an electronic allowing of the pressure out the nozzle, but the principle is the same. This computer control of the injection point has distinct advantages in that the injection point can be advanced or retarded as the engine speeds up or slows down. However, Electronics and salt water don't always mix well. Number five, what do diesels need? Well, diesels need to have a cool, clean air supply. And that's why you need to have a good quality air filter and preferably some forced air ventilation. This is particularly true for turbo engines. And it's one of the reasons that most turbo engines have an intercooler. The intercooler cools the air going into the turbo before it goes into the combustion chamber. The reason for this is that cold air is denser than hot air, so again, a bigger bang. Diesels need to have a good quality oil, as recommended by the manufacturer, and it needs to be changed on a regular basis. We've talked in previous videos about how important the cooling system is on marine diesels. Marine diesels create heat on the compression stroke, as well as on the power stroke. Keeping the engine at the right temperature is fundamental to its operational efficiency. Because 
diesels compress air for the power stroke, there needs to be good bores, good piston rings and a good seal around the valves. The valve stem oil seals also need to be in good condition, especially on the inlet valve, or oil can be drawn down the inlet valve guide and into the combustion chamber. Diesels also need to have a clean and clear exhaust, especially around the exhaust injection elbow. Not having a clear exhaust causes excessive back pressure. Excessive back pressure will cause low performance from your engine and also can prevent all the exhaust gases escaping from the combustion chamber. OK, let's look at smoke. Let's look at black smoke first. Black smoke is unburned or partially burned fuel. The most common cause for this is overloading, which is sometimes referred to as overfueling. Because more fuel is fed into the engine than it can efficiently burn. The causes for this can be a fouled prop, a blocked exhaust elbow, or even poor compression from a badly warned engine. But it can also be from bad injectors. Injectors that are not clean or not adjusted correctly. Or it can be the injector timing. All of these need to be looked at. OK, let's look at white smoke. This can have many reasons. and It's often difficult to diagnose what those reasons might be. However, generally it's caused by low compression. A failure of the compression stroke to reach its full temperature. Remember, when the piston comes up on the compression stroke, it's actually heating the air in order to create the burn. So what are the causes? Well, generally they're engine wear. Rings, bores, valves, valve guides and seals. But don't mistake smoke for steam. Remember that steam will dissipate within a few feet of the boat. But smoke won't. It will linger. OK, let's look at blue smoke. This is normally accompanied with excessive oil use, poor performance, excessive crankcase pressure. The causes? Well, generally it's engine wear to things like valves, valve seats and seals, piston rings and bores, or low oil pressure. All of these point to you burning oil. OK, let's look at not starting, or poor starting. This can be a number of reasons, but here's some of them. You can have a worn starter or the starter circuit might not be operating correctly. It can even be a flat battery. One of the things that uh, fails quite often are the starter relays or the preheat relays for your heaters. The heater's not working, i.e. the heaters themselves have failed. You can have low compression by worn wings, bores or valves. Blocked or reduced exhaust bore that can cause a lot of starting problems. The timing can be wrong, or it may need adjusting. It does need to be adjusted from time to time. Now here's another top tip. If your engine doesn't start within a couple of goes, do not keep cranking. The raw water pump will continue to push water into the engine, and basically you'll fill your exhaust pipe up. When the exhaust is full, it will then flow water back into the engine, and the engine will go hydraulic. Patreons support the making of these videos. They don't support our lifestyle. The money that we get from Patreons and from YouTube goes towards better equipment like cameras, gimbals, headsets and data that we have to purchase for uploading these videos to YouTube. If you're not a Patron, why don't you pop over to our Patreon page? The link's in the description. Or you can use this one here. We'd love to have you on board and Patreons get lots of other things, like real-time updates, tracking facilities, they can tell exactly where we are at any given time. Patrons can send us messages and take part in our Patreon forum. We can answer technical questions, get suggestions for them from videos and much more. So if you're not a Patron, come on, join the crew! In the next video, we're going to look at pre-start and fault finding. So we'll look at the checks you should do and things you should look for. We're even going to put together a pre-start list for you, which will soon be available from our website. Until next time, thanks for watching and don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Sail safe!